My next guest on Composer Talks with White Bear PR is considered the queen of documentary film scoring. Please welcome Miriam Cutler. Thanks for joining me, Miriam. Ta-da! <laughs> the queen has arrived. Where's my band? <laughs> Um, Miriam is a three-time Emmy-nominated composer, and she has an extensive background in film, television, and even scoring two circuses. Uh, her passion for documentaries has led her to focus on scoring for nonfiction films, such as RBG, Love Gilda, The Hunting Ground, and many more. Now, Miriam, what has made you decide to focus on documentaries? Well, you know, it took me a long time to realize this, but I, at a certain point in my career, I realized, my God, I guess I'm an artist. And to me, what being an artist means is that I really am passionate and care about what I do. And so I felt like doing music has always been wonderful and I'm naturally good at it, but just doing my own music didn't really satisfy my other urge. I have a background as, a, as an activist in college and after college, I worked in a um, public interest legal firm, you know, and did a lot of research for them for, for all kinds of uh, really important issues like redlining with financial, you know, like discrimination, financial discrimination and housing loans, um, mm -hmm. forced sterilization at County General and many, many, many other really important issues. And this was in the 70s when I was quite young. And so I thought I was going to be having my career working in that kind of social justice uh, area and maybe as a journalist. But what happened was I just was in these bands one of which was the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. And I just kept being pulled further into music. So I eventually realized that I should just, I was only going to be young once. And I thought, you know, I think I'll do this for a while and then return to it sometime when I'm more mature and, you know, don't have so many wild oats to sow. So I did that, but of course I, and I, and I actually was able, you know, I did many different kinds of musical work. I was, I had working bands, you know, I had, uh, I, I produced records, I worked in a singing telegram company and all these different things, but eventually I landed in scoring. And what happened was after about 10 years, I was solvent, but totally miserable because, you know, I was working all the time and I was working on things that I didn't care about. Some things I was really embarrassed to have my name on like low budget horror movies and even soft porn, you know, uh, they became called erotic thrillers. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I'm going, my God, how did I get here? You know, after all this education and all these lofty ideas I had. So I was pretty much ready to chuck it. I just thought, you know what, if this is what my career is going to be like, I don't think I want to do it anymore. I was doing corporate videos and, and then I met this filmmaker named Arthur Dong and I didn't know it at the time, but he was a very esteemed, revered documentary filmmaker. And he, I met him at a screening of something I did and we were talking and he told me about this film he was working on and it was called License to Kill. And it was basically, uh, he was a gay man and it was about, it was about, he wanted to understand why some people believe that it's okay for them to kill gay people and mostly gay men. It was gay men killing gay men. I mean, men killing gay men. So he actually went into prisons and, and met with some very notorious uh, murderers who had killed gay men. And he just let them, you know, he interviewed them and let them tell their story. And when I heard that, I was just blown away. I thought, oh my God, now I know what I want to do. And I just, you know, developed a relationship with him and he included me. So he took me to Sundance, you know, and it won two awards at Sundance, 1997. And when I was up there with him, it was like I entered into a new world where I belonged. It was just all these incredible filmmakers from all over the world, activist filmmakers, people doing social justice work, really important stuff. And, and it, it was like, I finally hit the jackpot and I realized what it was I was, wanted to do. And basically I've stayed in documentaries. I met so many people that first year I was there and they became some of my best friends and I've worked with them. And I, I knew I wanted to be part of the documentary community right from then on. And so that's what I did. I built my whole career really, the most meaningful part of it for the last 25, 30 years has been in the documentary community. Yeah, that's an excellent marriage of your activist past to, you know, yeah. your current professional life to be able to have a voice in what is being said uh, in these nonfiction documentaries, because some of them are quite poignant. Yeah. And I haven't seen License to Kill, but that sounds incredibly interesting to, to listen very, to these amazing. points of views. Yeah, it's a really amazing documentary because Arthur is such so skilled at, at 
forming a relationship and getting people to talk. And he was very skilled in how he put it together. And, and you know, I remember the first time I saw it with an audience was a press screening. And I'll never forget, it was like, it was in the afternoon at Sundance and the place was full and everybody was excited because Arthur had a, quite a reputation, uh, independent filmmaker. And, um, and at the end of the, people couldn't even move. They were just like, they couldn't stand up. You know, they were just like, oh my God, because it was so intense and so illuminating in a frightening way. Um, and so from then on, you know, I just, uh, I've, I've worked on so many films, many of which go a long way towards, you know, leading to legislative change. I mean, the hunting ground, you know, so much happened as a result of that as sexual assault on campus. Um, I mean, I've worked in Ghosts of Abu Ghraib, Dark Money, all these really heavy duty issue films, but they have an activist component and the films are used to organize around change. So for me, that's just, you know, my, it's just my work. I mean, that's what I want to do. Yeah, and often films have really fascinating subjects. And I know you got to meet um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg because you scored RBG and you guys got to meet at the Sundance Film Festival. And I was just curious, have you met any other subjects of your films and does that ever just impact you emotionally? Well, it's funny when you work on films, you feel like you know the people. So it's kind of embarrassing because what happens is I'll go to Sundance, like I worked on a film called Thin about eating disorders and you know, you meet them and I know them, but they don't know who I am. So I'll be, go up and I'll start talking, you know, and thinking I know them, but they have no idea because they never met me. So in that, you know, that's usually more like what it's like. Um, but I have, you know, I met Robert Wilson and, you know, I'd met, I actually met Terry Gilliam, but it's not like I have, I'm friends with them or anything, you know, but it, no, it's yeah. fun to get into their, their life and the way they think in their head. I learned a long time ago, I used to book a jazz club and I produced some jazz albums. And what I learned a long time ago when I was young and like in the eighties was um, it's better to not get to ever meet your, the people that are your heroes because you know, you build them up in your mind. And I remember meeting some of my most, you know, these jazz greats, you know, and they were just like really angry and stuff. So, you know, it's like, they didn't really yeah. care that I was a big fan. <laughs> Sometimes it's fun, but not, not always. <laughs> right, of course. Yeah, well, no, they always say don't meet your heroes. Um, yeah, much better what, not to. What would you say is one of the most rewarding things about scoring for documentaries? Oh, well, there's so many. I mean, the first thing is the relationships and the kind of people that I'm surrounded by, the community I'm part of. I, I admire them. I respect them. We bec I love them. We become really good friends. We share values. And so it creates a whole world for me to live in where um, I don't ever feel like I have to compromise anything about who I am and what I care about. Um, and so that's really, I think it's really important to understand as an artistic person that you have to nurture your talent, you have to make space for, you know, and you have to really respect yourself and what your contribution is to a project. You know, I really try to teach this when I'm working with young people. I didn't learn it till very late in my career. I was steamrollered a lot, you know, when I was younger. And I've really learned, at, the more I respect myself and approach them as an equal, like, you know, I don't have to take this job if I don't, if it's not, you know, if I don't think it's worthy of my time, you know, if, you know, if you're not going to care about the music, you're not going to give me a realistic budget, you know, then why would I do it, you know, because, <laughs> because I mean, it's, it, you know, there's plenty of other projects that will do it. So I think uh, when you approach it that way, people value you more as a professional. They treat you professionally. And, and so I, I think it's really important that we all value our own creative contributions and also the blood and guts you spill because being a film composer is a very unique. You have to be a fountain of constant imagination and ideas. And you have to work within these parameters that are sometimes so unrealistic with budget, time, you know, resources and constant rewrites, which I'm in right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, I mean, it's really daunting, you know, it's, it's really, you have to have a lot of skill sets. So, um, it, it's really important to make sure that where you're putting your energy is worthy of that because it, it really is, it steals your life. You know, there's really not time for much else. How do you balance quality of life, uh, versus, you know, a composing career? <laughs> well, I think mostly I don't, it's cause the career takes it all. But I have to say, I'm learning, I may be an elder, but I am starting to learn 
that and really by incorporating what I was just talking about, when I learn to respect my own contribution and my own professionalism, it helps me be able to make choices and, and set up working situations that actually allow for me to have a, a bit of a life at least. But when you're on deadlines, you know, and they're constantly recutting and changing things, while you're on a film, there's, you know, you just have to stay available. There's, we live in fear, you know, because it might seem like you have a lot of time to do something, but of course you have no control over what happens in between you get the job and then, you know, but, but then, but the rewards are great. And I have to say, I always used to think when I was young, I want to, I want to, I want to know, I want to make sure that when I look, when I'm in my sixties, which I am now, and I look back on my life, that I don't feel like I wasted my time. Am I glad, am I happy with my decisions? I think it's a really important, like I do that test almost every day. Okay, how do I feel about these decisions? Now that I'm old, it doesn't matter as much, but when you're young and you're spending your whole life, all your time, you want to, you don't want to get there and go, what did I do with my life? Yeah, you know? no kidding, yeah. And that, it kind of keeps you in line, like, okay, this decision actually matters, you know, whether I keep taking these kind of jobs I don't want to really do. At some point, you have to say no and just believe and take and take that leap of faith. And if you can't make it, then maybe you shouldn't. You know, it's mm. you know, I mean, it's a hard way to go. But I do think that you have to make it meaningful for yourself, at least. Absolutely, yeah. I um, now you've spoken pretty adamantly about um, uh, publishing and keeping publishing when you can, uh, because obviously that then contributes into your. Um, you know, your retirement. income and <laughs> retirement and also your quality of life. So can you just talk yeah. a little bit about that topic for those that might not understand publishing or that they even have the ability to ask for it? Yeah. Um, you know, a long time ago, there was a system set up in Hollywood where, you know, in the old days, there were TV studios and movie studios and composers were employees and they worked for them. You know, it wasn't like today where there's all this independent freelance work going on. Everybody worked for, you know, somebody pretty much, you know, there were some independent films, but so the way the whole system was set up is that whoever is producing the movie gets the rights to the music and they pay you a salary. They pay for all your expenses and they do this somewhere along the line. And it had to do with Mike Post. They set up uh, independent contracting and it was a way that a composer could make more money by controlling the budget. So like if I get a certain budget and I can get it recorded cheaper, I can keep what's left. And I think some of the entrepreneurial composers liked that and it is great, but um, they still, let's see. So at that point they didn't re reimagine the publishing deal. So even though they're independent contractors, they're still losing their publishing. So publishing is half your income. You get back end on every show you score if it's, if it's broadcast and overseas plays in theaters or broadcast and there's mechanical royalties and all kinds of, of income. And if you don't own your publishing, you're basically losing half of that income. So in the independent world, you don't really, there's no reason you have to give up those rights. Um, you can make, there's all kinds of negotiable points within that. And I can't really go into it in this internet because it's too short, but yeah. I mean, people should really understand that anytime, especially if you're working on low budget films, in an independent kind of film arena, not with a big corporation like a movie studio or a network, you should all, there's no reason to give up your rights. And there's stuff on the SC, on the Society of Composers and Lyricists, there's stuff on the website, resources about publishing and contracts, and people should really get knowledgeable because this is a business model. If you can't, if you don't have a business model that's sustainable, you can't be a film composer. So if you're constantly losing money, you can't stay in business. I mean, how can you keep doing it? It's so expensive to record and everything, you know? And so um, you have to figure out how you're going to live. And right now it's particularly, so my business model was in, I decided to stay in independent film where I could have more control over my everything. You know, I work mm -hmm. with people they're, they're They understand the value of what I'm bringing and they don't try to steal my publishing or take my publishing, you know, that when they don't need it because they don't have a publishing company, you know, so there's no point right. they don't, they don't do anything with it. So I think that, you know, this model has sustained me and it's taking me into my, you know, it'll be part of my pension per se, because I don't have a regular pension. So um, the business model that I used was because I do these, these independent docs and they usually either are broadcast in the United States 
they might not be broadcast here, but they might be broadcast overseas. You get a lot more royalties in America, typical of our business model here. You know, somebody dropped the ball with video cassettes and music royalties. Somebody dropped the ball with movie theaters and music royalties and even some mechanicals, I think. So, you know, because the big business was controlling the industry. I see your eyes glazing over. <laughs> <laughs> but this is really well, I think it's a, it is important. It's important. You know, I'm not a composer, but I want them to hear from you about how this is, why this is the case and how they have the ability to, to even in, in their situation, ask for publishing so that they can retain more of their royalties and income. Because also, if you own that music, like I've been writing music for 30 years, I have a huge music library and it's all recorded. And so I can actually repurpose that. I can license it. I can give it, I can put it in libraries and I can get all the income from sync licenses and royalties. So, but if I didn't own, like a lot of my friends that worked for the studios and stuff and did the big time stuff, they don't own any of their music. They can't even put out an album without permission. You know, they can't do anything with it, you know? So, I mean, I just felt like from the get go, I, I'm, an in, I'm more of an indie person anyway. So I just kind of went that way. Um, and now with, uh, so my business model has worked really great for me, but, it, but it's changing again because of streaming. And once again, music is behind in, in the negotiation. Mean, they're trying very hard to, to raise the standard and the payments. But right now they're much lower than network television or even cable. And mm -hmm. so I know BMI and ASCAP and CSAC, they're all working very hard to try to get those blanket licenses up. Um, and we have to really hope they do because if that doesn't happen like i don't know i'm sure many people who will see this look at their bmi statement or whatever i look at mine and there's all the cable and there's the network and then there's the overseas and theatrical stuff and then there's there's like pages and pages and pages of streaming 0 0.01 cent you know so something that i might get three hundred dollars for a play or five or a thousand dollars for a play somewhere 0 0.01 cent and you can get like 20 pages of those and it ends up being $3. Now, nobody can live on that. So if that doesn't change, there's no more profession, really. There's no more professional composer, except right. the, the tech people that are doing the big temple stuff. You know? Yeah, it devalues the, 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 the worth of all the work that you're putting into things by just streaming it, you know, whatever, for a cent. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, it's, it's, it's impossible, you know, so we all have to fight really hard to protect our rights. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to pivot a little bit because I really wanted to make sure we talk about this before we wrap up. But, you know, The Hollywood Reporter did an interview with you and that's where they called you the queen of doc film music. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> And uh, the, the article was focused around your um, ability to generate the category, the TV Academy for the Emmys for the best music in a documentary series or special. Uh, I just was wondering if you could just tell me a little bit about that process and how that category came to life. Yeah, well, in the last few years, you know, I mean, yeah, so for many years, there's been, it was a real group effort, you know, I got to be the one that helped get it across the line, but there's been people trying to do it for a long time. Because it was evident that um, there's so many things to talk about in regard to this. But um, so documentary film composing didn't really, the, the chances of getting nominated for an Emmy, unless you're already a very major A-list composer, were pretty much none. <laughs> you know, very rarely could some unknown person get it because the Emmys run a certain way. Of course, with all those, so two of the things, People have approached me over the years to try to help get that to happen because they know I'm an activist and stuff. So, um, I mean, people like Mark Waters and Mark Adler and, and um, Mike, Michael Levine and, and Ricky Minor, Ricky Minor, he was our champion. He's a governor. Yeah, and incredible. He's just an incredible guy. And, you know, he just, you know, he, the, they brought me on to the executive committee. The first meeting, they said, okay, Miriam, we want you to do this. Tell us why we can get it, why we need a documentary Emmy. We're gonna do it this year. And so I did all this research. I got Catherine Joy, you know, helped me d develop statistics. We had little graphs. And then I wrote an essay about why documentary scoring is different and deserves to be in its own category. And then the second part of the argument was, you wanna increase diversity in, our, in the, in the uh, TV Academy? People working on documentaries are a lot of times, you know, they can't get the bigger gigs or they're, or they're just starting out or there's someone like me who just likes being an independent film. 
And if you want diversity, and you know what? Since we've had that, now look at the Emmy nominations this year. It's in, what yeah, a difference! It's super diverse. Like you know, where sometimes you'd be lucky if one woman composer would be nominated, and this year you have three. Hardly ever. You know. Yeah. <laughs> And the first year, I guess maybe to thank me, everybody nominated me for two, you know, but yes. I mean, it's like, but this year there's more than, there's a lot of women on, on up there. So it's all part of a piece of, you know, of opening up, having, having our industry look more like our country, you know, just like in politics, we need our politics to look more like our country and that's starting to happen mm -hmm. and our government needs to look more like our country. And so, and also it's so, it's, it's just bring, brings such freshness and vitality to our industry to have many more points of view and all these talent out there. And, and so uh, it's been a really, I feel very proud, you know, to have been part of helping that happen. And, but it didn't, you know, the first year I was there in the executive committee, Ricky decided that he couldn't, we couldn't try for it because they had just gotten the music supervisors and there's a whole, you have to finesse, like he did the politics inside the, inside the academy and he's brilliant. Right. He understood the timing wasn't right. And it was disappointing. We'd had all this stuff ready to go and we just couldn't do it that year. The next year we did it and he took it right across. It was just- and That's amazing. You know, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> um, my last question for you is what is something that you would like to accomplish still in your career? I want to write a really fun musical. I've done it before, but way a long time ago. Um, and I'm dying to have a good, a good script, you know, to do a musical or radio theater, things that are a little easier mm -hmm. to get going, you know, with a good story. Um, and I also want to, I'm actually in my dotage. I am looking to um, have a little more of a relaxed life where I can, tr I mean, I really love to travel. You know that. Yes. And I want to do a lot more of that, you know, if we ever get let out of our cages. Um, right. And, and so I want to spend time, you know, traveling the world. One of my most favorite things, I want to do more teaching internationally and in, like in places that are more offbeat, like, like Iceland, we did Estonia, Portugal. Mm -hmm. I want to go to these kind of places and teach. And, and I, I love doing that and, and interacting with the film and music communities in those other countries. So that, that's a big, I want to do lots more of that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me on Composer Talks with White Bear PR. And yes. for anyone that's interested, just check out Miriam's music and go to miriamcutler.com or find her on Spotify. Uh, she's got all sorts of great music out there. So I hope you all check it out. Thank you so much for joining me, Miriam. Thank you for having me. I can't wait to see you in person. <laughs> me too. <laughs>